And welcome to this session on mixed areas of practice. As Ashley said, my name is Fiona Whiteside and I'm a junior tenant in my first year of practice at 20 Essex Street. Um, we have uh, lots of different practice areas at 20 Essex Street um, and they fall loosely under three heads. We do shipping and commodities, private international law and public international law. And today I'm going to be talking to you about shipping which forms, at the moment, about 60 or 70 per cent of my practice. Um, my name is Rachel Tandy. I am a barrister at Henderson Chambers. Um, I have been in practice for about six years now, and I personally specialise in commercial disputes, insurance and product liability, um, but Henderson Chambers generally is known for um, essentially a mixed common law set with a commercial flavour and particular expertise in post-disaster litigation. And the format of this session is going to be um, Rachel and myself speaking about our practice areas for about um, five or ten minutes each, and then we will open it up for questions. Um, and uh, I will be talking based around a structure of five bullet points that uh, we've been asked to speak on. So I'll start with um, why I chose my practice area. Uh, then I'll talk about some of the cases I've worked on recently to give you a flavour of uh, what shipping law is like in practice. Uh, thirdly, I'll explain what I find appealing about this practice area. Uh, fourthly, the lifestyle implications of a shipping law practice. And fifthly, what key skills and personal qualities are required to succeed in this field. So, um, I suppose I chose uh, shipping law slightly by accident. I didn't go out seeking it. I applied to 20 Essex Street for a mini pupillage, because at the time I was working at a German university, the University of Passau, and there I was teaching um, world trade law and um, having researched uh, barristers' chambers in London, I saw that 20 Essex Street had a strong reputation for bilateral investment treaty disputes, for um, uh, various areas of public and private international law where those fields overlap, and I thought, great. Um, and on my first day of the mini-pupillage, uh, I sat with a barrister called Ollie Kaplan, and he gave me a shipping dispute to look at, and I just found it completely engrossing. It was about the construction of a charter party, which simply means a, um, a contract under which a ship is uh, hired. And the question was whether a provision of the Turkish commercial code had been effectively incorporated into that contract or not. Um, and I thought that this was such an interesting question that I looked at the name of the barrister who was on the other side, who was from Quadrant Chambers, um, a, uh, uh, another well-known shipping set, but not quite as good as 20 Essex Street. Um, and, uh, and then I went and did a mini pupillage at Quadrant as well, and so I gained more experience in shipping and got more and more interested. Um, the types of cases that we work on, as I said, we do a lot of um, uh, disputes about the construction of charter parties. Um, but I want to give you uh, three examples of cases that I've worked on in the last uh, two and a half weeks. Uh, the first is one that I did on Wednesday and Thursday, this week that's just finished. Um, that was about um, short delivery of bunkers. Now, bunkers are the fuel that the vessel uses to sail. Um, and short delivery simply means that insufficient fuel was delivered. The question was, who was liable for this? Was it the charterers or was it the owners? Um, because... Uh, Normally what happens under a time charter where a vessel is hired for a period of time is that um, the charterers will pay for all of the fuel during the period when um, the vessel is theirs. And then um, uh, there will be a, a sort of set off, a buyback, when the vessel is given back to the owners of the vessel at the end of the charter. Um, and there is a rate specified in the charter party for calculating that um, uh, the, uh, the amount that's payable for the remaining fuel on board. And uh, the charterers had chosen to deduct from the hire that they were paying to the owners the amount of the fuel that had been short-delivered in Singapore. 
And uh, the owners uh, came to us and said, well, is this lawful? Can they do that? Um, so I spent a couple of days sitting down and, um, and trying to uh, understand what the charter party said because it wasn't at all clear and there was no case law in it. And that's absolutely typical of the sort of disputes that you get in shipping, that um, there is legal uncertainty and there is more than one um, uh, possible interpretation. Um, and it's about thinking through the different arguments and coming to what you think is the, the most reasonable and the, the most attractive um, solution. Uh, hopefully I'll be right on that, but it was only, only an advice, so it's early days yet. Uh, the second uh, matter that I've been working on recently is um, uh, on, I was doing it on Monday, that was another advice. Uh, and that was about demurrage, additional freight and deviation. Now the third of those, deviation, will be probably fairly self-explanatory. The vessel had deviated due to bad weather and there was a dispute over how much um, extra hire should be payable. Um, the second uh, point, additional freight, is also probably fairly clear. The amount um, of cargo that was loaded onto the vessel was alleged to be heavier than, um, uh, than had been contracted for, and so the owners had charged additional freight. And the first demurrage, that's quite a technical term, that means that um, there is a window um, which the charterers have to load and unload cargo for the vessel. And, um, and if you exceed that window, then you're charged a penalty rate, um, and that's called demurrage. Um, these are fairly <coughs> typical disputes at the very junior end of the shipping bar, so you'll see a lot of those. Um, and the third um, thing that I've been working on recently was another demurrage dispute. That was um, a defence that I was writing for um, uh, an arbitration. Um, but the... The shipping sets in London tend to uh, also have um, lots of commercial work that juniors can get involved in as well. Um, and so I've been doing that alongside a um, uh, $1.9 million claim in the British Virgin Islands that I've just been instructed on in my own right. So it's quite exciting for me to do such a high-value claim by myself. Um, and I've been junioring on uh, lots of um, uh, points to do with conflicts of laws, and um, also recently on a dispute about fiduciary breaches after the termination of an agency relationship and what duties the agent continues to owe to the principal. Um, so what you can hopefully take from what I've just told you is that um, shipping practice and, um, and commercial practice more generally, I suppose, but particularly shipping, is a very law-heavy practice area. It is um, very... Uh, academic. You spend a lot of time at your desk. Uh, I am three months into practice and I've not yet been on my fees. Um, so uh, there's plenty of scope for written advocacy, certainly, but um, we don't spend a lot of time travelling around the country, going to different county courts. That's not what this practice area is about. But if you enjoy contract law, if you enjoy tort, if you enjoy um, really sitting there and thinking hard about legal problems, then this is definitely the practice area for you. Um, so moving on to my uh, third bullet point, what I find appealing about this practice area. Um, what initially attracted me to it, as somebody who hated contract law at university, um, was the internationalism of it. Um, it is quite rare to have an English party in a shipping dispute at all. I don't think I've ever come across um, a, a dispute with an English party in it. Um, uh, I enjoy, when I get new instructions, going onto Google Maps and finding out where the ports are and having a good look around at um, where the different berths are and that sort of thing. Um, I enjoy um, Googling the vessels and looking at images of that class of vessel and understanding it. Um, uh, in the uh, additional freight dispute that I mentioned earlier, um, the instructions came with lots of um, detailed plans, loading plans, showing the different cranes on the vessel and um, the exact uh, operational plan for how the um, cargo was going to be uh, loaded and stowed. And um, th the ability to really visualise what you're dealing with um, 
and to understand how all of the things that we use in our everyday lives, the clothes that we're wearing right now, the coffee beans that, um, that I've just drunk, um, the, uh, the pen that I wrote my bullet points with, how did that get into my hand? It came on a vessel into some port in probably Felixstowe or perhaps Plymouth or Southampton. Um, and I, I find that fascinating. I quite enjoy just looking at container ships in Whitby. I'm from Yorkshire, so in Whitby. And, uh, and looking at the container ships going past and thinking, look at all the contracts on board that vessel. I find that's really sad, but it's also really, really cool. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, it's slightly geeky, but that is what I find um, fascinating. And there are so many overlaps with conflicts of law, with um, insolvency, with public international law, with trusts law, um, with company law, um, even with construction. There's lots um, and lots to get stuck into. Uh, the lifestyle implications, well, it won't surprise you, given how international it is, that uh, there's a lot of travel. Um, so I haven't yet been abroad, um, but I spoke to uh, one of the clerks responsible for um, uh, practice management for shipping in our chambers, and he said that um, uh, it is really required um, to go and do business development trips overseas, particularly in the Far East, um, in uh, Hong Kong, in Singapore, uh, also in, in Greece. Uh, that's another area where um, a lot of our members are active. Um, that that might happen three to four times a year. And in addition to that, you will have hearings overseas. Um, and that it's not just a one-off commitment. You need to keep going out to um, visit the same solicitors to um, continue to maintain your commercial reputation overseas. And um, the fifth bullet point that I was asked to talk about is key skills and personal qualities that are required to succeed in this practice area. And again, my clerk was very helpful with this. He said that you need usability, friendliness, approachability, and speed of response. Um, and I'm sure that... Uh, in any practice area, a clerk will tell you that those are really important qualities. I think you also need um, uh, to be good at dealing with um, the ebb and flow of your workload. That probably goes for other practice areas as well. So when you have downtime, just to uh, let yourself relax and not worry about when the next work's going to come in. Just enjoy it, because when the work comes in, then you're going to be really, really busy. Um, and that can be a little bit difficult to manage at first, but um, uh, I think it's one of the most appealing aspects of a career at the bar. Um, and languages are also very useful. So, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, I started uh, my working life teaching uh, law at the University of Passau, so I speak German as well as English. Um, but other languages which will be helpful in shipping include Spanish, uh, Mandarin, Greek, um, Italian, it all, it all helps. Um, and there are opportunities to do cross-examination in those languages. Um, a number of members of chambers have cross-examined in Mandarin or in German. Um, uh, one of our uh, shipping bar barristers, um, Socrates, is Greek, so um, he obviously works in Greek quite a lot. Um, that brings me to the end of my five bullet points. Um, so I hope that that has been helpful. And um, after the other panellists have spoken, there'll be an opportunity for questions. And do also feel free to flag me down afterwards if you see me walking around the fair and ask any further questions. OK. Um, before I start talking, we should probably introduce Andrew. Yes. yes. Andrew, Andrew Redknapp, from Two Temple Guards. Yeah, hi then. Sorry, <coughs> carried away trying to sell chambers to uh, other, other <laughs> attendees at the fair. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a really quick intro um, about chambers generally and what um, range of work I do. Uh, I'm going to talk about the three reasons why I think having a mixed practice is actually a really cool thing to do. Um, and I'm just at the end going to touch on some you know, slight downsides, occasional, occasional uh, bad patches. Um, of having that type of that type of work. Um, so first thing we're going to talk about Henderson generally. Obviously, I said we're a broad common law set um, with a commercial focus. We do a lot of post-disaster litigation. What does that mean 
uh, we help businesses get out of a jam. Uh, that's essentially what it means. We're known for product liability, health and safety, group actions, international mass torts. So at the moment we're on uh, the Volkswagen emissions litigation. We're on both sides of that. Uh, people in chambers are basically representing absolutely everyone in Grenfell Tower. Um, including there are members of chambers who are um, counsel to the inquiry in that as well. Um, we're doing the Siroxat litigation. Uh, there are members of chambers who are doing the Iraqi civilians litigation. Um, so all that sort of work is, is the, the headline sort of types of work that we do in chambers. Um, for me, generally, as I said, I specialise in commercial insurance and products. Um, within that, I have uh, retained a broad practice because um, I want to reap the benefits of doing that, which I'll tell you about later. Um, but the best way to explain what I do is to give you a flavour um, of what I did this week. So uh, what have I done this week? I have drafted particulars of claim in a financial dispute between uh, a firm and an ex-partner. It's all very acrimonious, so that's quite interesting. Um, I've had a con with some solicitors in a consumer group action I'm instructed on. Uh, that's to do with some procedural advice. I have done a trial in a personal injury claim brought by a 12-year-old boy against his former school. Uh, I've given some advice to a government body uh, about potential criminal liability under the Health and Safety at Work Act. Uh, I had a telephone con with some solicitors and my leader in... Um, a case where we just received pleadings in a commercial conspiracy um, dispute. Uh, and I've also prepped a cost and case management hearing that I'm doing next week. Uh, that's in a um, property dispute between um, some members of the same family. Um, so again, uh, it kind of gives you a flavour of, of how broad the things that we do are. It's pretty unsexy to describe your practice as a mixed common law practice. Uh, it sounds like a sort of misc other category. Uh, that you might fall back on if your other pupillage applications aren't successful. Um, but there are good reasons to not view it that way uh, and to uh, put mixed sets at the top of your list. Uh, so I'm going to tell you what they are. There are three of them. Um, the first one is variation. This is the reason I came to the bar. I don't want to do the same thing every day. Um, so it's a sort of selfish reason for me. It keeps me interested. Um, but also, I think having a mixed practice improves your skills generally. Uh, the reason for that is that you can borrow from different areas of practice and apply the skills you learn in other areas. One example of that is last week I was doing a uh, Crown Court trial um, and learning, I was, I was being led, I should say, so um, I'm still, I'm still um, developing in that area. But what was really interesting about it was learning sort of some of the advocacy tricks that um, criminal advocates use, and particularly when they're communicating concepts to the jury or where they're preparing some cross-examination. Um, and I found being in that sphere very interesting and very useful, and you can sort of steal some of those tricks and use them in your um, advocacy when you're doing civil work as well. Um, it also keeps me in court, um, and I think this is, this is quite important. It's particularly important for our chambers where we do sort of, we do some quite core heavyweight, interesting commercial work. If you only do that type of work, because quite often you're being led, um, it can be difficult to, to get into court in your first few years in chambers on your own. Um, in my set, we're very keen to get our juniors into court and get them on their feet and used to, to doing their own advocacy. Um, and knowing, essentially knowing the basic things like, you know, which side of court are you supposed to be standing on? Um, you need to know all of that sort of thing, and I think it's really important um, to maintain a breadth of practice that means that you will be able to do that, even if you are, um, as I am, starting to specialise more in sort of more commercial areas of work. Um, the second thing I think is good about it is um, it gives you some uh, sort of commercial benefits. What do I mean? I mean, in Chambers, we are able to provide a really good client service because we have um, established commercial clients who come to us with a range of different problems. They might range from health and safety prosecu prosecutions to employment relation disputes to partnership or joint venture disputes to uh, product chain, uh, contract chain, supply chain um, disputes. We are able to help them with all of those things and the risk that we are then gonna lose those clients to other sets of chambers, if they need to go elsewhere, 
to get the advice that they need. That's obviously always poses a risk um, commercially. And we're able to, to negate that by essentially um, providing a really, really good service and a really broad level of service to our clients. Um, the other commercial reason that I think is significant is having a broad practice means you're insulated against variations in the market. So uh, over the last couple of years, you may have read about um, the issue with employment tribunal fees. When employment tribunal fees were brought in, there were far fewer employment claims being brought. Um, and what that meant was the pure employment sets obviously had to find a way to diversify to sort of make up for that loss of work. Um, because we are a set that occupies various different practice areas, we're far better placed to be able to diversify and adjust our offering in response to, to what the market's doing. So if there are other developments like that in other areas of law in the future, we'll be better placed to be able to, to guard against them. Um, and the third reason why I think it's important is it helps you find your role and your specialism. <coughs> I think legal education is very good for a lot of things. It's not particularly helpful in getting you understanding the realities of practice and different types of practice and what they mean. And particularly for me, there were some people who've come to our stand earlier who I was telling about this. I did the GDL and so my understanding of different areas of law was limited to, to that sphere. So when I first joined Chambers, I really wanted to experience as many different practice areas as I could um, because I was wanted to sort of find out which of those was right for me? You know, when you go to interviews and people say, what kind of laws do you, do you want to do? And frankly, I just didn't have any idea. Um, so I really wanted to have that opportunity. Um, and I think the, uh, it also helps you to sort of shape your practice and your lifestyle the way that, that you want to. So again, if you start broad, um, you can discover, actually, I want to be in court more, or in fact, I want to be in court less, I want to do more paperwork. And you can shape your practice after a couple of years according to, to the way that you want to organise your life. So those are the, those are the uh, benefits. There are two um, downsides that I want to talk about very briefly. Um, one is when you're in practice. Um, the difficulty with a mixed practice is that initially everything is new. Absolutely everything. Uh, so I can remember when I was in pupillage, someone coming into to my pupil master and saying, can, can Rachel help me on this thing? Uh, it's a piece of work um, to do with public procurement. And my pupil supervisor turned to me and said, are you happy to do it? I said, absolutely, that's great, that's fine. He walked out of the room and I thought to myself, oh my God, what is public procurement? I have no idea. I had no idea what this area of practice was. Um, and so you've got to learn to pick up new concepts quickly. Um, you need to be hard working. You need to be a fast learner. You need to be adaptable and you need to be resilient. Um, so that can be challenging and you can, in your first sort of year or two of practice, be walking around all the time feeling as if you don't really know what you're doing. Um, whereas other people in other sets who do a single area of practice might feel more comfortable in that area much more quickly. Um, but that passes. Um, and at the end of the day, I think what it gives you is a much broader sort of toolkit of skills to be able to apply. Um, the other sort of very mild downside is for you right now in your applications. When you apply to a mixed set and they say, why do you want to come to this set? That is a really difficult question to answer. You need to answer it well because so many people don't. And if you answer that question well, you will set yourself apart. How do you answer it well? You need to use your mini pupillages. You need to use events like this where you can meet barristers and get under the skin of chambers and find out what it's really like, what sort of work they really do, how often are they led, how often are they in court, etc., etc., and use all of that inf information to feed into that question on the application form because that is the hardest one to answer. If you want to go to a mixed set, it's really difficult to explain why. Um, and also, if you want to go to a mixed set just because of the reasons that I've said that you want to develop a broader understanding of different areas of law, that's fine. It's fine to say that. You know, it's much better to say that than to say, I'm coming to Henderson because I really love product liability. And then it becomes obvious from your form that you haven't really done it and you don't really know what it is. And you're just saying that because you think that's what we do. Um, a final note, I think having a mixed practice gives you a more rounded working life. And ultimately, I think, although I'm slightly biased, that it makes you a better advocate and a better barrister overall. 
Um, so that's that's my more than five minutes. I'll hand over to Andrew. Yeah. Um, right. Uh, yes. My name's Andrew. I'm from Two Temple Gardens. Um, and we are um, very close to Henderson Chambers, not only geographically, but in the areas of, of law that we do. Um, so I, I'm going to try and not go over all of the same ground that Rachel has already very masterfully covered. I think the only significant difference probably between mine and Rachel's practice is even though I've been in practice for seven years, I still don't feel comfortable doing uh, or thinking that I know what I do <laughs> whatsoever. So um, that might be the only real difference. Now, um, and I'm going to pick up on, on a few of the things that, that Rachel um, mentioned. At Two Temple Gardens, we do a broad range of civil work. We don't do any criminal work or any family work, which is where there's a, a, a slight difference between us. But within civil work, we do a broad range. So it stems from personal injury to insurance, to employment, to commercial, to private international law, which is disputes about which jurisdiction a case should be heard in and which country's law should apply to a case. Now, the um, benefit of having a range of practice areas like that in a set of chambers is very much as Rachel has said, that in our increasingly more complex and globalised world, um, different areas of law feed into each other. And very frequently, a dispute will have a number of different facets, which means that it cannot simply be approached by a lawyer who has only ever done personal injury work. If, for example, you have an employee who's got an acrimonious dispute with their employer, they will very regularly also um, say that they are suffering stress at work, which may be potentially is leading to a psychiatric injury on their part. So you have to understand from the very outset of a case like that, what are the potential remedies in an employment tribunal that there may be, versus what are the potential personal injury remedies that may be available in a county court or in a high court. So you need to have a certain breadth of practice, I think, to, to practice in civil work. Also, increasingly, um, private international conflicts of law work. When you have a commercial dispute come in, or a personal injury and human rights dispute that has come in, very frequently you will have um, a company that's based in London, it has its main head office in Paris. It operates a mine in West Africa where it employs lots of Chinese labourers working under contracts made under Chinese law. Something goes wrong and untangling uh, precisely which court you even need to be in before you even begin to think about the merits of a case is not a simple matter. But again, to, to be able to appreciate a case like that and provide effective advice you need to be, to an extent, comfortable with employment issues, personal injury issues, conflicts of law issues as well. And you also need to know when you've reached the outer limits of what you're comfortable with advising on and get other people to provide some assistance as well. So a broad civil practice, I think, does mean, as Rachel has said, that you can provide a better service to clients in a, in a changing world. And it also means that you you keep on doing interesting work and are regularly opening up books that you may not have opened in, in the previous month. So I do recommend it as an area of, of practice for that. Secondly, advocacy. At Two Temple Gardens, from the uh, very first moment that you start your second six and that the Bar Standards Board says that you're good enough to be unleashed on the unassuming public waiting for your services in the county courts, we unleash you and expect you to go along and provide a good service to a client. Um, and in fact, that is what happens. I think probably many barristers will say that the best service they ever provided was in their second six, when they were so nervous about the small claim road traffic accident they were doing that cost about 500 pounds and 70 pence that they spent three previous nights getting ready for it and are therefore stellar when they come in to do it and blow everybody else out of the water. But that is what we do at Two Temple Gardens. We expect um, our second six advocates and beyond to be in court three, four, five times a week. What that means is that when your practice develops and hopefully you stop doing road traffic accidents every single day of your life after a year or two and you start doing higher value disputes, you will often find yourself against somebody from um, perhaps a more commercial set of chambers who has never been on their feet in court. And it makes a real difference. You can find yourself therefore doing cases in a civil set against advocates who are 
many, many years senior to you just because of the fact that a client trusts you to be able to turn up to court wearing the right clothes, putting your bands on correctly and knowing what to say at the, at the outset of a case. And it can make a huge difference and you can therefore get, um, after five or six years <coughs> of call, getting into pretty exciting territory, being up on your feet against silks from other sets of chambers in big high court litigation and indeed beyond um, doing appellate practice as well. So if you are applying to, or thinking of applying to a mixed um, civil set, you've got to be somebody that wants to do the job because you like advocacy. Now personally, I don't know why you would do this job if you didn't like advocacy, because that is ultimately what we are, but it's a very important part of um, what we do. Another aspect that um, it leads into is that you get to travel the world on a very regular basis. Now again, initially in your practice, the world tends to be restricted to the southeast of the United Kingdom and Reading, Slough, and perhaps the West Country if you're, um, if you're a bit lucky. But you do get to travel around the country on a very regular basis and get to know courts, judges, all over the place. I think it's a real asset to this job because um, a solicitor will tend to travel much less regularly and tend to be in the office um, for, much, for a much greater part of the day. I think it's good mentally, psychologically, and to develop as a lawyer to be in different places, meeting different kinds of people, you're preparing your, your briefs last minute on the train um, and doing that sort of thing. It does also mean that when, again, your practice develops, you can be doing much more international work and international travel. Um, I do a lot of international human rights work where businesses are involved, which can mean that you end up uh, you know, in, in all sorts of places across the globe, interviewing witnesses, um, getting to know them, helping them, explaining the process through to them, getting ready for litigation. And it, it means that there is a real um, ability to go and do that sort of work in, in lots of juri different jurisdictions if you're interested in it. The other real um, benefit, I think, of core civil work, such as that done by, by us and by Henderson Chambers, is that you can be involved with cases that are core kind of cases that people will be taught about at university on their law degrees, rather than doing very specialised niche areas um, which you know, aren't fundamental to how the law works. Um, you get to do taught cases which everybody will be taught about. So, for example, some of the cases that, that members of chambers have in, been involved with in the last sort of 12 to 18 months at Two Temple Gardens are a case I was involved with called Kamal Williams and the Bermuda Hospitals Board, all about causation and how you demonstrate whether a negligent um, act in hospital has actually resulted in someone's injuries. Is it sufficient to demonstrate that uh, a negligent act has materially contributed to a process which led to somebody being very unwell and, and finding themselves on an intensive care unit? Or do you need to go further and demonstrate that, but for that negligent act, they, they wouldn't have been in the position they are? It's the sort of stuff that's absolutely fundamental to how tort works, and you get to do that sort of stuff. <coughs> Another example is vicarious liability. There have been a lot of decisions in the Supreme Court um, in this area over the last... Uh, 12 months we've been involved in some of these cases, one of them called uh, Mohammed and, and Morrison's, all about if you go into a petrol station and you come out with a broken arm and in a much worse state than you came in because of an altercation with a, a petrol station attendant, can you go and sue Morrison's, the employer, for that? Uh, and what do you need to demonstrate? What is the nature of the connection that needs to exist between the employee and their employer and between the, the act that the employee performed? and the scope of their employment. Absolutely fundamental stuff to how we all go about our daily lives, but core civil work gets you arguing um, cases that I think are of, of fundamental interest up from the High Court, from the County Court, to the Court of Appeal, to the Supreme Court, and very occasionally, if you've done very badly in all the courts below that, perhaps in the European Court of Human Rights, um, which you ideally don't, don't want to get into. So. Um, that's, that's a broad overview of the sort of exciting stuff that, that civil work brings. In terms of its disadvantages, again, um, Rachel has set a, a lot of those out. Um, it is a difficult area of practice. If you're somebody that likes to 
be in the office at nine o'clock and know that you're going to be leaving at five o'clock the next day. That isn't always going to happen, especially in your earlier years of practice when uh, many briefs come into you somewhat later than you would ideally like and in a state of organisation that is not quite what you would um, want either. It does mean that you can find yourself sort of trying to unjam the photocopier and printer at 11pm on a Tuesday ready for appearing in front of a county court judge the, the next morning to argue a case. Again, to do that sort of work, you need to be the sort of character who doesn't mind doing that and actually find sort of the thrill of flying by the seat of your pants um, quite exciting. I enjoy that, it works well for me, but you need to be aware that it, it's, it's not for everybody um, and it, it can play havoc with your personal life. On the other hand, it means when you've blown the other side to pieces and won your case in the space of 90 minutes and you're over by 11.30, you can occasionally go home, put your feet up and um, put on Jeremy Kyle or whatever for the rest of the day, getting, getting ready for uh, the, the battles to be fought on the Thursday. So it's got its pros and cons. I think the pros outweigh the cons and I, I encourage you um, to apply. And yeah, best of luck. Any questions you have, fire away, as long as they're not too difficult. <laughs> So, um, if anyone does have any questions, pop them in. So, and then it's time to one of your questions. Yeah. Um, what would you say the most challenging aspect of being a barrister is, and how would you overcome that? If you could just name one. I think the hardest thing about it is the fact that the buck stops with you. And when you're doing cases on your own account, and it's, as Andrew said, it's 11 pm at night, and sometimes you're sitting in your room in chambers thinking, God, how. How am I going to run this? How am I going to organise this cross-examination? How am I going to try and nail this witness? And you really want someone else to just fly in and tell you the answer? They don't. Mm. You've got to work it out by yourself. And that is, at times, it can feel quite lonely. Um, how do you deal with that? Well, um, the first thing is actually when you have worked out the answer for yourself, it's really satisfying and it's kind of like a drug. You want more and then you find yourself doing it again. Um, but the other thing is, um, in my set, we have a really, really good support network amongst all of the junior barristers. We have an open door policy. I can go and knock on the door of anyone in chambers, up, all the way up to my head of chambers. If I have a problem and I, I have a legal issue that I really want to sort of chew someone's ear about, I can go and do that. For me personally, I find that support system really important. And I think, as I was saying, when you're trying to get under the skin of chambers, it's an important aspect to try and find out about. You were touched upon it before, but how did you find uh, them like persuading uh, your chambers about your motivation in their set when it comes to such a mixed area of practice? Ooh, I don't know. Andrew, do you want to take that? Yeah, no, I'll, I'll have a go at that. Um, <laughs> I think what it's important to do is to try and get a reasonably deep feel for what a set of chambers <coughs> actually does. Um, lots of chambers fall into the sort of marketing trap of basically saying we are the best at everything, okay? You'll go onto their list of expertise and it'll be like a dictionary, okay? Um, very often that does not really reflect the reality of what a set of chambers really does on a day-to-day -day basis. The fact that somebody in 1970 did a, a media law dispute does not mean that when 40 years later media law is listed on their thing that actually it's a core part of work. And I think when you're at your stage, it can be very tricky to get a real sense for what it is that people actually do do on a, on a, on a day to day basis. I think one thing to do, which will immediately put you streets ahead of other candidates, is look at a few of the barristers, some of the juniors, some in the middle, some at the senior end, go on Westlaw, go on Lawtel, put their names in, look at what cases they've actually been in look at the cases and you will immediately get a far, far better sense for what a set of chambers actually does. And then first of all, decide, is this what I want to be doing? Or does this sound dry as anything that I want to, you know, wouldn't ever touch with a barge pole? And secondly, if it does sound like the sort of thing that's up your street, then <coughs> look into those cases, read them, and be prepared to put down on your form, you know, I want to come to two Temple Gardens because you do cases about very large road traffic accidents, whatever it is, okay? 
but um, an application which has been targeted to a set and which demonstrates a genuine understanding of what people have done and in the recent past um, will I think immediately sort of make you stand out. I can't even remember your question anymore and I probably <laughs> answered a totally different one. So feel free to re-ask it, but yeah. I think I would maybe add to that that um, at the commercial bar, I think the statistics are that about 60% of cases settle before um, they uh, reach court or arbitration. Um, and they're, particularly at the shipping bar now, a lot of cases are dealt with in arbitration rather than in the courts. And so typing things into Westlaw will only get you so far. Um, you really need to come to events like this. Um, you need to uh, try to um, go and um, look at the Combar website and see what events are going on. Um, some of the Combar um, events are not um, exclusively for members. Um, go to the inns of court. Uh, speak to the education departments at the inns. Um, and uh, go along to the Domus dinners and those sorts of events to talk to barristers, find out about what they're really working on. Um, speak to judges and find out what the, um, the areas that, uh, that they're uh, dealing with a lot in the courts at the moment are. Um, and on the applications question, how to make your application stand out, um, in my view, the most important thing is um, to think and think and think about what it is that really attracts you to that set. If you cannot come up with a reason, don't fake it, just don't apply. Um, only apply to the sets you really want to be at, um, and then spend time unpacking that reason. And it's much more um, uh, helpful to read an application where um, a great deal of thought has gone into explaining the narrative behind the motivation. Um, for example, uh, when I was applying for pupillages, um, I um, remember being interested in one set that had a slightly different um, practice area, a set of practice areas, than, uh, than the um, uh, commercial shipping um, practice areas at 20 Essex Street. Uh, it was a predominantly public law set, and it did some commercial public public work, but um, it was just run-of-the-mill public law. It didn't do a great deal else. Um, and the reason that I was so um, engrossed in, uh, in what they had to offer is that I'd been reading Jeremy Hutchinson's Case Histories by Thomas Grant, which is a fantastic book, and I really recommend it to all of you. And I'd been uh, reading about the cases Jeremy Hutchinson had done and how they... Um, followed social change and social progression. And then I've been reflecting on what the new cases are going to be that are going to break ground in civil law, in public law, in constitutional law, that are going to shape society going forwards. And I thought, it's data. It's how um, uh, we interact with the corporations around us, how we interact with the state, how we're surveyed, how we're monitored, what everybody else knows about us, and how we understand the boundaries between the self and what is mine and what everybody else can access and what they can, how they can deal with me. Um, and I was engrossed by this, so I um, uh, wrote an application all about data, data protection, privacy, um, and I explained that I've been reading this book and I explained my train of thought, and I think to this day, it's probably the strongest application I've ever written. Mm -hmm. That's what you need to really do to help the people reading the application to understand why you care so much about it. And that's the sort of application that, that will stand out. I don't know whether you guys have anything yeah, to yeah. Absolutely. add to that. Yeah, I w the one thing I would add to that, actually, is, is um, give yourself time to do your applications. Every year, the pupillage portal, or whatever it's called now, I don't know, crashes. Every year without fail and your last my the last day both I applied two years in a row and even the second year I hadn't learned I still left it all to the last minute and I still spent about 12 hours hyperventilating that I hadn't got my applications in on time because the whole system was down give yourself the entire month I think the portal opens early so you can download the application form early um, and I would recommend you do that as early as you can and start thinking as early as you can about all of those things because a well-crafted application takes time mm. 
Is there anything else? Any more questions? I was just wondering, which side in the Mohammed case was your chambers on? So, we were, I believe, representing Morrison's. I wasn't involved, I wasn't involved with it myself, but, yeah. I'm sure that you met a five. No, we're all here. Yeah. Got nothing, nothing else to do. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much.